Today we're going to be reading Luke chapter 15. But let me start by asking you this question. Were you ever expecting to receive an award, a gift, a promotion that you thought you deserved just to find out that somebody else got it instead of you and you are left disappointed, in disillusion, even upset. A while ago, I was watching a long distance race on TV and the lead runner was approaching the end line and it seemed to be that she was far ahead of the rest of the crowd. So you could see her smiling at the cameras and raising her arms with pride, tasting the victory that she thought she deserved after much hard work. But to her dismay, out of nowhere, from behind, one of the other runners came, was able to catch up with her, and finally passed her and got to the end line just a split of a second ahead. Oh, you should have seen her face. <laughs> it went from having a big smile to having a, a face of panic to being really sad and disappointed because she was not able to win the race. What a fiasco. What a disappointment, what a tragedy. Today we're going to read from the Gospel of Luke a similarly tragic story of a father and his two sons. One of them, the oldest son, is well behaved and very obedient and he thinks he deserves honor and praise. The other one, the young one, he's reckless and foolish, and yet eventually acknowledges that he's about his folly, and, and he turns around. Just like in the race, the proud son, the older son, he feels confident that he deserves the prize, and yet it is the reckless son, the young son, who repent and turn around the one who is ultimately celebrated. The story that we're going to read today teaches us that a reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. A reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. So we, I will invite you now to please open your Bibles. We're going to read uh, chapter 15. The story of, that we're going to read today is really starting in verse 11, but for context, we are just going to read a couple of verses at the beginning of chapter 15. So please follow as I read Luke chapter 15. This is the Word of God, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. That's to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he, Jesus, told them this parable. Now we go to verse 11. There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he, the father, divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there, he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in the country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his field to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. 
But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate. For this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Verse 25, now his older son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he, the servant, said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he, the older brother, was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, Look, these many years I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this your son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you kill the fattened calf for him? And he, the father, said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we approach to your word, we ask you that you would do in our hearts what you alone can do, that you will apply your word as it's needed in this room, that your spirit will speak through your word to your people for their good, I pray. In your name, amen. So we started chapter 15, the first verses of the chapter, because the context, the context around which Jesus tells this story is very important. It helps us to understand the purpose, the aim of the story. The goal of this parable is to communicate simply this, that a reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. And we are going to, to see as we dig into the story. So read with me again verse 1 of chapter 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. That's to hear Jesus. The story starts by showing how tax collectors and sinners are trying to get close to Jesus. They want to hear what he's teaching. Tax collectors were Jews who had the infamous task of collecting taxes for the Romans. Because of that, they were hated. They were not only working for their Roman enemies, but they were also taking advantage of their fellow Jews by collecting extra money for themselves. They were considered immoral traitors, despised sinners, 
And it, it is them, these tax collectors with all their group of sinners that are drawing near to Jesus because they want to hear what he's teaching. Verse 2, and the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, these men receive sinners and eats with them. Now we have the Pharisees and the scribes. If you don't know who they are, those are the religious leaders of their time. They know the scriptures very well. They can memorize long portions of the sacred writings, and they are able to teach them to others. They are meticulous about following rules. They are respected and admired and have a high view of themselves. Most Jews consider the Pharisees and the scribes as the standard, as the bar raisers of morality and well behavior. They are the complete opposite of tax collectors and sinners. No wonder why they are grumbling against Jesus. He's teaching to tax collectors and sinners and even having meals with them. He's befriending them. He's spending time in their homes. He's interacting with them closely. Why is Jesus among sinners, they think, rather than being with the well-behaved, reputable models of morality? The Pharisees and the scribes cannot believe it. They, they do not interact with sinners that are unworthy and unpure, impure. They do not want to be involved with them and be contaminated by them that will ruin their reputation. You, you see the picture of the story, how the, the Pharisees are there and they are looking at Jesus and Jesus is teaching the tax collectors and the sinners and, and be, in, in all these things as they are grumbling, Jesus looks at them and he's about to tell the story, the parable, a story that illustrates the condition of the souls of the self-righteous, self-confident Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus is about to reveal what hides behind their fake morality and to let them know that a reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. Now, you may be surprised on how this story may apply to you personally. Perhaps this parable is more relevant to your life than what you may initially think. So as we develop the story, as we read the story from the Bible, I want you to have in the back of your mind this question. How does this story apply to me? You can ask yourself, how does this story apply in my own life? Where do I find myself in this story? Which of the characters of the story represents me best? So let us listen now what Jesus tells about this story, about the parable. Jumping again to verse 11. And he said, Jesus said, there was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he, the father, divided his property between them. That's between the two brothers. So the story starts with this selfish, rude, insensitive young man. He has actually little respect for his father. All he really cares about is the inheritance that he's about to receive. Now, imagine that you go to your father and you tell him, Dad, I don't know how long you'll be around, but I don't really care. What matters to me is that I am young and I want to enjoy life. I want to travel around. I want to have tons of fun. And I don't have the patience to wait until you die. So why don't you just give me the money that will be mine anyway? Give it to me now. And surprisingly, the father does it. He divides his property between the two sons and gives the young what he asked for. Verse 13 
Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. So the young son doesn't waste any time. He receives his money, and not many days later, he takes off. And he goes as far as he can, away from his father, away from his home. Why? Perhaps he does not want anyone around questioning his actions, calling him out on how he's living and using his money. He wants to have fun and no Joe Killer around him. So he goes far away and wastes his money, burning his inheritance in reckless, wasteful living, drinking and smoking, doping and paying women to satisfy his desires. He's living the life. He's enjoying his freedom with no one telling him what to do. Verse 14, and when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pots that the pigs ate. And no one gave him anything. So now we find the young man, he spends everything, all of what he had. Now remember, the father didn't just give him his weekly allowance because he did his chores, right? He gave him a big pile of cash. He, he gave him an inheritance that he's supposed to manage wisely and spend carefully. But the reckless son spends everything, all of it. If he had a credit card, his credit card will be smoking because he will be swiped left and right until it's maxed out. But then his days of fun come abruptly to a full stop. He, who has, he has squandered his property completely, and now a severe famine arises. The economy has collapsed. Wall Street has fallen, and he has no savings and no job. There's not even much food around. There's a famine. So he joins a stranger who does not even offer really him a job. The reckless boy is so desperate that he offers himself to this man without expectation of even payment. No one gives him anything. He's sent to the fields to feed pigs. Pigs. Now, the fact that the animals that he feeds are pigs may not precisely make ring in your, a bell in your head, but for a Jewish audience, and particularly to the Pharisees and the scribes, pigs are not just any type of animal. No, pigs are bad. They are impure and unclean. Jews do not eat pigs. They do not even get close to them. Pigs are awful, despised animals to be avoided. Only filthy pagans have really pigs. If you think about this, the, the boy went far away to a country where there's no Jews. That's why they are raising pigs. And now he has to be around them. So when the Pharisees and the scribes hear about the story that Jesus is saying about this miserable boy craving pig's food, they probably feel a strong repulsion. They may be even gagging, feeling nauseous at this point. I'm not sure that you and I can actually grasp how vivid the, the story is. Maybe, maybe if you imagine that the boy is among big, fat, ugly rats, in the streets of a dirty city, and he's with them, and the rats are all over the place, and they're like, <laughs> and he's trying to eat the food of the rats. That's just yakko. That may imperfectly illustrate the effect that the scene has over the original audience. 
Verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. In his misery and desperation, the reckless son remembers his father. He remembers the wealth, the security, the shelter that his home used to provide for him. And he, he thinks, even the hired servants of my dad have more than enough bread to eat, and here I am dying with hunger, craving the food of filthy pigs. What a fool I am! I will go back to my father and humble myself. I know that I have sinned before him and against heaven. I recognize that I'm unworthy to be called his son. He has the right to reject me, but I will beg him to take me as one of his servants. I will appeal to his mercy. So the young son takes a deep breath initiates the long and painful journey towards home. He doesn't know how the father is going to react. He may reject him, and rightly so. Now, let me ask you this. If you were the father, and your son treats you the way this young boy has treated his dad, how, how would you react? How, what would you say? Would you reject him? Would you tell him, I told you so? I want to make sure you learn the lesson before I let you back. I will clearly set the conditions under which you can come back to make sure that you never do it again. Is that what you will tell him? Is that what you would do? Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. So I don't know exactly what the father was doing right before the scene. According to what we can read, one day the father sees far off and far in the horizon, he sees a distant figure. And the distant figure is walking very slowly, dragging his feet head down, a crooked man, skin and bones. He has clear signs of a starvation. And as the father, with his old sight, tries to force his eyes to see if he can recognize this distant figure. All of a sudden, it hits him. It is my son. It is my son, my young son. And an overwhelming wave of compassion and mercy and unspeakable joy floods his whole being. He runs as fast as his old feet allow him to do. He rushes over his son. He embraces him and kisses him and rejoices in him. Verse 21, and the son said to him, Father, I have seen against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. 
You see, during the long journey back home, the son may have been playing in his mind and rehearsing over and over and over again what he's going to say to the father. Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. We know this. We know that he was saying that because it is exactly the same words that he had planned to say in verse 18 and 19. But before he says the last sentence, of what he had planned to say in those verses. The father interrupts him, verse 22. But the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. As the son is coming back home, he has all torn, ragged clothes he had no money. He had squandered it all. Perhaps he's half naked. His sandals are falling apart. Maybe he's barefoot. His hands are dirty, dry, cracking down. And the father says to his servants, quickly, quickly, bring the best robe. Let's dress my son. Put a ring on his hand and shoes in his feet. Dress him like a prince. Go to the field and find the best calf and kill it immediately. We will feed him like a king. He does not have to crave for pig's food any longer. Let us eat and celebrate for his back. My son is back. He was dead, but he's alive. He was totally lost, but he's found. That's the, that's the peak, that's the climax of the story. But the story does not end there. The rest of the parable is painfully anticlimactic. This is not the type of story that ends with, and they live happily ever after. We read that the older son comes home from the field as he had been working hard there, and he hears the music and the dancing. Celebrate that son. Come on. Let us celebrate him. And he hears this dancing and this music, and he's wondering, what is this convulsion? And he asks one of his servants, and the servant comes to him and tells him, it's your, it's your brother. He's back. Your father has received him sound and safe, and he asked us to kill a calf to celebrate his returns, and the older brother thinks, like, what? Why? How can this be? This is outrageous. He's so furious, he, he refuses to get into the house. So the father goes out to implore him to come in, but the older brother will not take it. He replies to his father, unleashing his anger. Verse 29, look, he tells him, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I may celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fat, fattened calf for him? What an injustice. If you were in the shoes of the older brother, how would you React. Do you think that the father was being unjust? I mean, he has actually a good point, right? He has worked very hard. That's what we teach our children, right? To be obedient, he has served his father faithfully, while the reckless brother has squandered and devoured his father's wealth. Would it not be just to reject the younger son so he will reap the consequences of his foolishness the rest of his life? Why are we celebrating him? Why are we celebrating such a reckless sinner? Verse 31, and the father said to him, son, you're always with me. 
and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad for this. Your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The end. That's how the story ends. The older son stays outside, bitter, angry, resentful, while the rest of the household is celebrating the return of the reckless son who seemed to be dead, but turned around and now is alive. That's how Jesus ends the story. Jesus tells this parable to the self-righteous Pharisees and scribes to illustrate their condition. They are actually represented by the older son who sadly never sees or accepts his problem and misses the celebration and the joy in the father's house. Just like the older brother, the religious leaders think they deserve a place of honor and they are blinded by their pride. They grumble about Jesus spending time with sinners because they don't see themselves as sinners in need of mercy. But through the parable, Jesus shows them that a reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. You know, the parable is addressed to the Pharisees and the scribes on one hand and the tax collectors and sinners on the other hand as we saw how the story starts in verses 1 and 2. But believe it or not, it also has an application to us. Some of us may be like the proud older son. Some of us may be like the reckless younger son. Or maybe you have bounced between these two in different seasons of your life. Perhaps your case is not as extreme as how it's portrayed here, but Maybe you have the tendency in your heart one way or another, and you need to pay attention to that. Let me ask you again. Where do you see yourself in the story? Are you a little or much like the older son? You work hard to obey God. You have done it for years. You think you're good and deserve much. And you secretly resent God when you see ungodly people succeeding while you seem to be stuck. Your life feels boring, packed with rules to obey, and you wish you had the freedom to do whatever you want. Or maybe you see yourself as superior to others and you despise the sinners and the pagans of the world. In your inner thoughts, you... you you think, there is no hope for this guy. He's so lost. There's no way he will become a Christian. There's no way God will put his eyes on him. There's no way he will save him. There's no way God will welcome him. This guy has such a pathetic and sinful lifestyle that he has no chance. Nobody sees what you think, but maybe you do think that way. If that is your inner logic, this parable is for you. Jesus warns you through this story, don't assume that because you look clean on the surface, you are clean inside. Do not be like the older brother or the Pharisees and the scribes. Recognize your pride and repent. Humble yourself and acknowledge that deep inside, perhaps you're not too much different from the reckless son. Do not keep running this race to tragically find out at the end that you did not make it. Repent, repent from your self-confidence and self-sufficiency and turn towards the forgiving, merciful Father. What about the young son? Perhaps do you see yourself in that character? Do you realize what you have received from God? 
Maybe you have squandered the riches, the gifts, and the blessings of the Heavenly Father. God has given you abundant life. He has formed you in the womb of your mother. He has provided for all your needs. He has lavished you with breath and life and everything that you need. What have you done with the abundant riches he has granted you? Have you used them for his glory? Or you have squandered and wasted his blessings. Do you seek to honor the creator? Or you follow your own selfish ways, misusing and squandering his gifts? As we were singing one of the songs, one of the songs said, come to the altar. The Father is waiting with open arms. It's not too late. Do not be a fool. Humble yourself today. It's not late. Today, turn around from your corrupt ways. Run to the Father. He's full of mercy and kindness and patience and love. If you humble yourself, he will receive you with open arms, just like the father of the parable. He will dress you with clothes of righteousness. He will cover you with naked, your nakedness, and celebration will arise as you go from being dead to being alive. Now, if, if you are honest with yourself, if you're a Christian and you're honest with yourself, you will realize that the story of the reckless son is actually the story of all genuine Christians. We were all once spiritually dead in trespasses and sins, worshiping idols and dishonoring and rejecting our God. But now you're alive. You were lost and you're found. This week, I had the privilege, the honor, the joy to have a special guest in my house. My childhood best friend is visiting from Bolivia, except that he's not my best friend anymore. The rascal ended up marrying my, my sister. <laughs> I don't know if he had planned that all along. But he's now my brother-in-law. And we were talking at the table, and we were recounting what we did as we were young. We both were raised in Christian homes with Christian parents. And I, when I was a teenager, walked away and stopped going to church. And sadly, I led him straight with me. And we were recounting how we did things when we were away from the church. Some of them were harmless. Some of them were stupid and reckless. I remember one night that we were talking and we used to mock Christians and despise our parents that were Christians. And I was telling him, we're never going back to church. That thing is fake. If there is a God, he will have to drag us to church. <laughs> I, I picture up there the merciful Father smiling, knowing the future knowing what was going to happen. He didn't drag me back. He was patient, merciful, compassionate. I can tell you the whole story maybe one day, but here I am. I'm preaching the gospel to you. I'm a pastor, and my best friend is a missionary. That's the story of all of us. Maybe your story is different. Maybe it's not as extreme. Maybe you don't see yourself as a reckless sinner, but whether it's, it's openly public and visible or whether it's an inner 
the struggle inside your heart. There's no one righteous before God. There's no even one that seeks Him. There's no one that can be acceptable before God. We all are reckless sinners, and we have to recognize that we are not worthy to be called children of God, and yet we are. Despite of our recklessness, God has welcomed us, not because of our goodness, not because of our good behavior, but because of what the storyteller, the one that told the story, Jesus, he went to the cross, so we, so he will pay the recklessness. God welcomes reckless sinners just like us who repent and turn around and put their trust fully in Jesus Christ who paid on the cross for our recklessness so we may become children of the merciful, gracious, and compassionate Father. And that's your story. And that is mine, if you are a genuine Christian. And if you are not, please, 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 if you don't take anything else, please remember a reckless sinner. If you are a reckless sinner, humbly repent, because a reckless sinner who humbly repents is celebrated over the proud whose confidence is in himself. Let us pray. Father, We marvel, we marvel, we marvel at your word. We marvel at your grace. We marvel at your mercy. We marvel at your love and our speakable compassion for us. We all are reckless sinners in need of mercy. I ask that the ones that are walking astray will, will turn around and run to you knowing that you're there with your open arms. If, if there are people here that struggle with pride and thinking that they're better than others, I, I pray that in your mercy you will reveal the condition of their hearts today, that they will turn from their pride and run to the merciful Father. And the rest of us, that we may live in awe, worshiping you, thanking you every day of our lives until you come back. And then we will do that for eternity because you are worthy. Oh, Father, you are worthy. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.